Helen Ride, who is the regional organizer for Reconciling Ministries, uh, could not be here, but she sent this email as, a, as an, a, a greeting for you. She says, Hi, SE Reconciling Friends. I'm so glad you're gathered together this morning, and sorry I can't be with you all. I'm at Lake Junaluska attending Holston Annual Conference. They have their RMN worship service right at the same time. The work we do together in the United Methodist Church has always been so important as we've advocated together for the full inclusion and affirmation of LGBTQ people in the church. Friends, we're on the cusp of change and we must not take our eyes off our hopes and dreams now. At RMN, in this season, we are learning, leaning into the work of changing hearts and minds, changing policy and changing practice. This is the threefold work we have been doing for 40 years and we're not about to give up. I'll be praying for you this week, especially as you seek to find a way to vote on the resolutions that were submitted. This is a good and holy work you're doing, and I'm so grateful for you all. Sent with much love from Helen. The other Tuesday, uh, Thursday night of last week, uh, the Upstate Reconciling Ministries group got together for the first time since COVID was uh, decimated all of us and several of us from the Reconciling Council were able to be there and um, Lee Roper presented a litany of inclusion and she gave me permission to use it this morning. It's on, pay, it's on uh, a printout that's in, on, your, uh, on your tables and I would invite you to uh, join with me in this. Let us praise the God who formed the mountains and created the wind. Let us sing to the one who made the stars, who turns deep darkness into morning and day into night. Let us turn to God, hating what is evil, loving what is just. So may justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Let us affirm each other so that all people, no matter what gender, what race, whether gay or straight, bisexual, transgender, queer, or questioning. No matter what religion or denomination, whether traditionalist or progressive, fundamentalist or atheist, let us affirm all people so that all will feel welcomed and included in the body of Christ. It is a difficult task as we live in this season of our church, and particularly as we meet in our annual conference. There's so much disagreement and divisiveness, contention and conflict that have been brewing over the last years in our United Methodist Church. The way forward is not always clear. May God give us strength to keep our voices raised in support of our sisters and brothers who have been excluded and marginalized. May God give us compassion, a striving for acceptance of a brother or sister May God give us grace as we struggle to walk in the ways of Christ, to love one another. Open our arms that we may embrace all God's children. Open our arms so as to touch the sisters and brothers, those of the LGBT community who have been wounded by the church. The church grew out of the ministry of Christ, who commanded to do love. Amen and amen. Thank you. Um, on your table, found a, a number of things. There is a little white slip. If You don't need to do it right now. If you will do it before you leave and just leave it on your table. Um, it is regarding the welcoming and inclusion of LGBTQ persons in my church. And I would rank as what we simply need is the city, the name of your church, and circle from not welcoming zero to full of welcoming ten. Um, one thing that uh, the Reconciling Council is trying to do is not only advocate for LGBTQ persons, but with this kind of information, uh, it has come to our attention, and we have adopted it as something we want to do this year, is there are people in our congregations who are forced 
to make a decision. Their churches may have voted to leave and they're not comfortable with leaving. And so what we're going to try and do with the information we gather here and during the conference to identify those churches which are welcoming of all people so that if somebody says, I'm, I'm at UMC church and I'm, I cannot stay here because they are leaving the de denomination, we will be able, hopefully, to say, well, there is a church nearby that we have un we understand, understand to be welcoming. Maybe you should try them. So we feel like that's, that's something that we, we need to do. So if you'll assist us in that. From my wife and I, along with several others, uh, sat at the table in, in, the, uh, in the ballroom. Uh, one interesting situation, we had uh, a woman from Pennsylvania who had moved here about a year or so ago, and she came by and she saw the table for Reconciling Ministries. Her first words were, gosh, I didn't know Reconciling Ministries was down here. So, that might have been me. <laughs> but, you know, I think, you know, I, I agree with what Helen said, and I think all of us do. This is, this is not going to be a single vote on a set of resolutions. This is a changing of the generation, a changing of my hearts and minds over who God's children really are. And that's something that we, we need to keep in front of us. This morning, our guest speaker is probably well known to a lot of you. Uh, she served as the district superintendent in Anderson. Uh, she was ordained uh, into the United Methodist Church in 1992. Uh, she is a native of Greer. She served, like many of us, in many different appointments. I was interested to see that she also served as campus minister at Furman University from 1992 to 1997, and that she was the 1995 recipient of the Denman Evangelistic Award. Uh, Susan and I met when we were students at Candler in, in, in Atlanta, and I have uh, had the privilege of listening to her, several of her sermons as she visited uh, Clemson United Methodist Church, where my wife and I now attend. So it is my great privilege and honor to introduce and invite to speak to you this morning, the Reverend Susan Leonard. Thank you, Warren, for that introduction um, and for the opportunity to reflect a little bit on my own journey. Before I um, share a little bit about my own journey of, of uh, the process and evolution of a, uh, of a person 30 years ago who would have said, love the sin or hate the sin, to a person who is advocating um, for full inclusion as an ally and advocate. Um, bef before I tell you a bit of my story, I just want to acknowledge that today is a significant day in the life of the South Carolina Annual Conference. I don't imagine that when um, RMN scheduled this breakfast that we knew on the agenda, because who knew on the agenda, when uh, exactly <laughs> Uh, the names of the churches who are disaffiliating would be coming forward. But as we know from the conversations that happened on the floor yesterday, that's today at 2. And um, today will mark a significant day in the life of the South Carolina Annual Conference of United Methodists. And we are here. It is happening on our watch. We have a voice and a heart and a call. And something about the way of Jesus compels us to live with this wide-armed, deep faith reflected in the life of Jesus who we continue to apprentice under. And so I know that there are those of you in the room whose churches that have been a spiritual home for you and your children, places where you've stood at that altar
to be joined in marriage or you've brought your children there for baptism or put your hand on their back while a pastor put their hand on their head to be confirmed and those churches today are disaffiliating and you are heartbroken and there are others of you who are um, walking lightly trying to keep churches your church that you love lay or clergy um, together hoping that we can make that journey to 2024 and find a way to move forward. I, I just want to acknowledge that there's a lot of pain in the room and a lot of hope in the room and a lot of the love of Jesus in the room. And while we, while we are not well organized to say, what next? What next? What happens with all the money that comes in from the 10% of the churches that are leaving? What's, what's next? Um, how do we mobilize to be lighthouse churches, safe places, to stay UMC? What's next? I hope that we will find ways to continue the conversation um, in, in terms of advocacy so that we just not, don't drift, but with intention plan, strategize, mobilize for the United Methodist Church of tomorrow. Um, I'm a big fan of Barbara Brown Taylor. She's a shaping voice in my own journey. And I remember her saying several years ago, not about the inclusion issue, but simply about the shift in the, um, um, in the culture and, and how it was that the, you know, the strongest um, rising faith group were the nuns or the duns. And, and she acknowledged that, that there's a bit of trepidation about that. What does that mean? You know, we look across the pond at England and uh, Europe and we wonder what that means. And um, she said, well, if you, your blood pressure is high and it comes down, or, or you are carrying extra weight and it comes down, perhaps there is a healthier, leaner, stronger body. And today is a day that we will both bless and release and mourn but I pray by God's grace there is a healthier, leaner, stronger body of a welcoming and inclusive church for all God's people. Amen. So, So with that, I'd love to invite us to open ourselves to the winds of God's Spirit as we seek to be the church that Jesus is calling us to be. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Loving and faithful God, you know the hearts and the hurts and the hopes we bring with us to this day. The church is your idea, your best plan to be an agent of touching and changing, transforming and guiding this weary, wounded world. We have signed on to follow Jesus. Accompany us and help us to accompany you. We give our whole lives once more this day to the ministries of your church that Jesus established for all people. Amen. Amen. Well, I, I will say that I look across this room and certainly across um, the faces of those who are front lines and impacting um, the lives of people and, and um, we, we all have stories to tell. And every one of us, um, has a gift to give in this room. Um, I, I, I feel um, 
that that what I bring today is really very meager. Um, it's it's one person's story. Um, it's a person um, who was shaped by the church of the '70s and the '80s, um, and in a culture where um, thoughts and understandings were much more restrictive and silent. Uh, I kind of came came of age. Some some of you um, ha- have had less far to travel on this journey of inclusion, and um, and for you, um, I'm grateful. And your stories need to be heard too. Um, so I guess I f- I feel like I come today like that little boy um, who said, I, "All I have is five loaves, two fish." Um, it, it's it's my little pail, um, but Jesus, you can have it all, and if it pleases you, you can use it, pass it around, share it, and if it pleases you, maybe it, it's enough to bring some nourishment. I'm going to trust that as I share a bit of my story today. Um, a lifelong United Methodist, um, I fall in that category of Um, What's the number one predictor of of adult faith? When I was a child, there was a church. And that church for me was Memorial United Methodist. And in the love of family and church family, I came to know the love of God. And I came to choose to apprentice under Jesus. That's still my life's work. As I, as I was shaped in faith, I, I found myself at a place of disconnection. This love of Jesus, this generous love, and a culture and a church that said, while all people are of value and worth, made in the image of God and beloved, we find the practice of homosexuality incompatible with Christian teaching. And that world and that discipline and that mindset shaped my early days. And the way I could make sense of of life early on was um, love the sinner, hate the sin. I even hate to say that now. But I, I would have stood in the understanding, under the umbrella of uh, we can love all people. If if we can love the sinner and hate the sin. But I've come a long way in my understanding that leads me to the place that I know that we all have sin, that we have misguided, misordered loves, that we act selfishly or arrogantly or um, spitefully, all of us from time to time. But to be a person whose orientation is to same gender attraction and to relationships that fall under the umbrella of covenantal, monogamous, and faithful, that is not a sin. And so my journey from this understanding of love the sinner, hate the sin that, that, that worked for a while no longer works. Because I, I do not believe that to be born with a same sex attraction and to be in a committed monogamous respectful, mutually affirming relationship falls in the category of sin. And my journey from this point to this point um, started not with a book, started not with a podcast, started not with a sermon, started with a person. I imagine the same is true for you. 
I was um, um, appointed right out of seminary um, to a small textile church in the Greenville District, Monaghan, and was pleasantly surprised to find that um, there were some Furman students that sort of made their way over to that small little textile community. And, um, and then more and more Furman students made their way over. And then the district realigned the Wesley Foundation from Traveler's Rest to Monaghan. And um, we developed a, just a community where older and younger and diverse people were part of that, um, part of that community in, in, in 1992. And one of the people who came was Christine Matthews. She was a Furman student then, now elder in the church. She brought Christine here. Um, many of you know her. Um, she certainly is an um, ally and advocate. Um, but she brought the clubhouse gang to Monaghan and after school program and we had a lot of our Furman students would work in that. There was one of our leaders, student leaders, whose name was Mike. And he was so faithful, both in the Wesley Foundation leadership and in the clubhouse gang. And as his time at Furman came to an end, he, um, he, he, he wanted to s support this work beyond his years at Furman as he uh, lived into the next chapter of his life. And um, I remember him saying, could, could you use my TV and VCR? Could you? Do you, anybody you remember VCR? <laughs> okay, at that point, that that felt like you know, like a generous gift from a 22-year-old. Like you can have my, you can have my TV, you can have my VCR, and here's the rug that was in my den. Um, it, it, it was a generous expression, and as he brought it over, as he was packing up, he asked if if I had a little time that week. And the way the schedule fell. Furman in those days, uh, the work of um, final exams finished up, but commencement was a week later, and uh, everybody had a chance to take a deep breath. And he asked for time. Could we walk around the lake one more time? And as we walked around the lake, we sort of reminisced. I could tell he was kind of pensive. Um, and, and I credited that early on to, well, you know, this is a huge thing. I mean, you leave the bubble of college and friends, and you know this life, and uh, the next chapter, what does it look like? Um, but, but that wasn't it at all. Um, as we sat on the bench there by the lake, he said, you know, I, um, I've walked along with you, you've walked along with me. We've had an honest relationship, but not fully honest. And I don't want to leave here with you loving only part of me. so that I can be completely me with you. I need you to know uh, of, of the struggle that I've been on most all of my life. And he shared his um, story of uh, coming to know and claim himself um, as a gay person and all the ways he had tried to mitigate that through high school and early college, all the things he had done to make it go away, to pray and to work and to uh, all, all the ways, the, the painful ways that he had asked and prayed and worked for God to relieve the burden and make him normal. And, and he, he shared his story with me through his tears. And, and through his tears, I heard him. So grateful for the vulnerability of that, the gift of that, the um, honesty of that, that could, that could make our relationship even more genuine, whole, and holy. Before there was a book I read, 
or a sermon I heard, there was a person I met. Now, Mike was the first of many in every church that I've served. There have been people who, as we've shared the journey of faith, um, have shared with me their struggle and their story. And I honor them. Yes. To fill yourself um, out of the norm is is one thing but to be marginalized because you feel yourself out of the norm is double and for anyone who knows themselves in their god-given essence to be part of the LGBTQ community I honor you today Yours is a, um, yours has been, I pray it gets easier and easier, a difficult journey to take. But because you have been willing to share your story, you change us. You open us. You, you break down the restrictive ways of seeing love the sinner, hate the sin, because it no longer works when you love somebody and for your courageous living out your belovedness in our midst you help change us M Mike was one of the people who set me off on this journey so uh, of course I had to go um, to this book that we revere that we consider the touchstone of um, our guiding principles, this document of scripture, tradition, reason, experience, and um, our Wesleyan heritage of uh, people of one book. And, and I don't have to tell you this, but when you, when you look at this roughly six passages that are lifted up in um, this library of scripture, Okay, 39 Old Testament books, 27 New Testament books, three passages in the Old Testament. If you count all um, the 29 verses of Genesis 19, 29 verses, there's one verse in Leviticus, there's another verse in Leviticus. Let's see, that's 31 verses <laughs> in 39 books. If you go to the New Testament, maybe we can get some more, you know, help there. How do we make this, um, to, to look at the three passages in the writings of Romans, 1 Corinthians, and 1 Timothy, then there's two verses, two verses, one verse. That's five verses <laughs> in 27 books. So let's see, let's see, that's 31 verses and 5 verses, so that's 36 <laughs> verses, verses in the canon of Scripture. <coughs> and if we're willing to do the hard work of simply looking at them in their context, none of those speak favorably certainly of um, same sex um, behavior but in every one of them though I don't have to unpack these for you know this they are conditions of either um, emasculating people out of power which is the Sodom and Gomorrah story it is about domination. It is not about mutuality and love and respect. Levitical law, well now if we're going to hold those up. Okay, so like no more shellfish for you. 
And then what do we do with those terrible verses about if you have a rebellious teenager and you just take them to the city gates to be stoned? And, and, and even in, in Paul's writings, uh, there is no understanding, no world view of the possibility that 4 to 6 percent of the population might be intrinsically at their essence wired to same-sex attraction. No, no, no sense, no framework of worldview. It's the same document that, that will say um, if you beat your slaves and they die immediately, then you have to be, then you can be, there's repercussions for you as a slave owner. But now if, if they don't die immediately and they, you know, they live another day or two, then no problem. So if we, if we elevate 36 verses and make them um, the justification, um, that, that just didn't square with me. If you use reason, that just doesn't work. And so I'm so thankful that the Word became flesh, dwelt among us, and his name is Jesus. And before there is a book, there's a person. The preexistent Jesus, who says, Let us make humans in our image. And who says, The very first word God ever said about you or me is, You are very good. You're very good. In your essence, very good. And so what keeps me living forward are people who are willing to share their stories. The reality of um, just the logic of asking 36 verses to hold the whole weight of moral, uh, our, of, our, of our ethics around this to substantiate and sustain exclusion. And then the life and witness of Jesus. So, so here's here are three things I would leave you with that, that continue to be a, a gift and a guide to me. The, the first is Jesus says as he was departing, I have many more things to tell you. I have many more things to tell you, but but you cannot bear them now. You're not even asking the questions now. <laughs> but I will send you the Holy Spirit who will remind you and will teach you and will continue to shape you into the future. I'm not going to leave you orphaned. I'm going to send you the Advocate who will remind you and guide you into the future. I believe that. This is the living word, and, and we serve a living Christ. And while we wish that Jesus had said something about this so that we could hold on to this, <laughs> how we wish Jesus had said something, we weren't asking the questions. No one was asking the questions. I have many more things to tell you, but, but you cannot bear them now. You, you're not even asking the questions now. But I'll be with you in the power of the Holy Spirit to lead and guide and remind and direct. That's the first thing. The second is probably Jesus' most familiar parable um, about the, um, the, the person who was bloodied and bruised and broken side of the road. And um, the first um, priest um, obeys the law, obeys the law, and walks on the other side because there are Levitical laws that say if you touch someone who may be dead, then you are unclean. The priest, the Levite, same thing, 
sees, but follows the law, does the right thing by the law, and then the third, the Samaritan comes and shows compassion. And while there are lots of ways to hold that diamond of parable up and look at it, what helps me in that story is uh, what, what Jesus elevates is not the law, but compassion. And the, other, the two who passed on the other side of the road, they were law-abiding, faithful people who wanted to do the right thing and kept the rules but missed the ethic of love. So that story, I, I keep wanting, I, I, want, I want to elevate compassion above the holiness code. The holiness code moves us to separateness and the compassion of Jesus moves us to togetherness. And I want to lean there. And then the third and final thing is just the whole witness of Jesus is this ethic of love. It, it is a love that is marked not by domination, not by exploitation, but by mutuality and respect, fidelity, commitment, love. It is the ethic of Jesus. The, the Word made flesh. And so while there are um, books to be read, and even this book to be read, while there are books to be read and sermons to be given and um, podcasts to be listened to, before there was a book, there is a person. And let's stick close to that person, Jesus, and then I am confident that with the help of the Holy Spirit, we will continue to make our way to all who are bruised and broken and bloodied. And by God's grace, be the hands and feet and heart of Jesus. Amen.